So I want to thank everybody for coming out. I'm going to do some introductions. So I am Jessica McCauley. I'm with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Division of Marine Fisheries Management. We have a panel up here, so I'm going to start with the panel. So we also have Jeff Renchen on the panel. He is formerly with FWRI, now with Division of Marine Fisheries Management. And we have Vanessa McDonough. She's Biscayne National Park's lead biologist. I'm gonna keep going around the room here. So we have Stephanie Walthall and Kristen Foss, also biologists in Division Marine Fisheries Management. We have our regional director, Tom Reinert. Um, so if you are media and you are looking for a contact, Bobby Doobie over there, if you could raise your hand, he is your contact for the media. Uh, we also have Melissa Rex, a biologist in Division Marine Fisheries Management, actually our section leader over analysis and rulemaking. We have our commissioner, Commissioner Soule, who's here tonight. Uh, we have Joe Llewellyn, the acting superintendent for Biscayne National Park. Um, we have the regional commander. Uh, our, our, we have the Captain Mazza with the <laughs> uh, from the regional office and uh, some other law enforcement officers. I feel like I'm forgetting somebody. CJ and Mason are probably still out in the hall. Uh, but And if you need Spanish translation, we're going to have Spanish translation over here in this area. So if you need Spanish translation, we'll have that tonight as well. Okay, I'm trying to see if I missed anybody on my list. All right. So welcome. Uh, I think most of you guys passed some of the materials as you were coming in. Uh, there's a number of handouts. Uh, you saw the posters as you were coming in, but there's handouts of what was on those posters. Also, if you're planning to speak tonight, then you need to fill out a yellow card. It looks like this, and uh, staff, FWC staff will take this up when you're ready and have it filled out. Um, we also have blue cards that look like this. If you decide that you want to leave early, but you want to jot down some notes and leave those for us, um, we have some blue cards out there that you can jot down some notes on. Uh, please silence your phones, and if you need to take a phone call, if you wouldn't mind taking that outside, please direct your comments and questions up here to staff, and all points of view are valid here tonight. So why are we here? So we're here to talk about uh, Biscayne National Park's Fishery Management Plan, which has been a long-term collaboration between Biscayne National Park and FWC to guide the fishery management in the park. There are several actions that are in the fishery management plan that require FWC regulation changes, and FWC has approved this fishery management plan and is committed to the goals in this plan. So this is an FWC workshop with our partners from Biscayne National Park here with us tonight. And so we're here to hear your input on a potential FWC fisheries regulations that could help reach the goals in that fishery management plan. So we're going to do four things tonight if you're going to stick with us. So first, we're going to do this presentation. Then we're going to have a question and answer session for the panel that's up here. So the questions could be about the regulations, about the science plan, uh, anything that you hear tonight. Then after that, we're going to do a live survey. So we're going to hand out these clickers, and we're going to do a live survey about the regulations that you see in the PowerPoint. And then we'll have an open public comment period tonight. So there's multiple ways to comment. I already talked about how you could fill out those blue cards. Uh, also, that live survey that we're going to have tonight. And then if you picked up one of these little business cards out front that has a picture of the park on it, on the back of that card is a way that you can go online and you can either type into myfwc.com saltwater comments. It is character limited. It only lets you write a small paragraph, but if you want to uh, write us a lengthy email or send us some, some attachments. Uh, the email address and that website are on that card. Also, if you want to speak to our commissioners directly, you can do that at the up upcoming commission meeting that's October 2nd and 3rd in Cape Canaveral. All right, I think everybody here is familiar with Biscayne National Park, but just to cover a few facts about the park. So Biscayne National Park is in, within sight of Miami. It's around 174,000 acres, most of which is covered by water. It's easily accessed from four public marinas and boat ramps. And there are over 500,000 visitors that visit the park each year. And this is likely an underestimate because there's a lot of folks that are actually launching from points outside the park and then coming in the park to fish and recreate. So there's a number of management and environmental challenges inside the park. 
including its proximity to urban areas, its reduced water quality, marine debris, vessel groundings, and fishing pressure. So let me go over a little bit with the authorities in the national park. So in 1968, this central portion of the park here, the blue portion, this is the part that is called the National Monument. Then in 1980, there were some additional areas that were given, these ha orange hashed areas, and it actually became a national park and it expanded to the current size that we know today. So in these orange areas of the park, these two end sections, FWC maintains authority over fisheries regulations in these areas. In the monument portion of the park, this central portion, FWC fisheries regulations also apply here, but in addition, the Park Service actually has final authority and they could come in and put additional regulations in place in this central monument portion of the park. Also, the majority of the park is in state water, so this dotted black line here is the delineation between state and federal water, so state water's on this side, federal water's out here. Federal waters of this area are actually uh, primarily managed by the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, and so this little sliver, 9% federal waters, this little sliver of the park here, the South Atlantic Council is deferring to the FWC and the Park Service uh, to manage this area inside the park. There's a number of diverse user groups that are using the park, including a number of people uh, that are doing recreational activities, recreational fishing, uh, diving on the reefs and historic wrecks, boating and kayaking, as well as birding and wildlife viewing. There's a few commercial fisheries operating in the park. There's shrimping, as well as lobster and stone crab trapping, and bait fishing, and some uh, hook and line snapper grouper fishing. There are two park management plans. There's the general management plan that establishes the overall long-term management philosophy for visitor use, and it looks at zoning in the park into different areas for use and protection. And there's no memorandum of understanding between the FWC and the Park Service relative to this plan. And then the fishery management plan is a long-term plan to balance fishing with the protection of natural resources. And this plan ensures that fishing can continue to be sustainable. And there have been a series of MOUs with FWC relative to this fishery management plan. So just a little bit more about the, those plans. So I'm gonna go over some history of the general management plan, even though that's not what we're focusing on tonight. So the park's original general management plan uh, was in 1983. And then in the year 2000, the park began development of a new general management plan. There were a number of scoping meetings. Uh, the, the park also began working on their fishery management plan at this time. And the most controversial item of the general management plan was the marine reserve zone or this no-take zone. And so there were a number of public meetings about this and ultimately in 2012, there was a congressional hearing about this marine reserve zone Following that congressional hearing, the uh, leadership of the Department of the Interior and the FWC asked staff to go back and look at some additional options in addition to looking at this marine reserve zone. Were there other options for how to manage uh, fisheries and habitat in the park? And the staffs of the park and the FWC came up with uh, what was called a special recreation zone or SRZ. And so this particular area was a larger area than the marine reserve zone and it was like a quota hunt on the water where there would be a limited number of people that could access this unique fishing opportunity in this area. So this was taken out to get input by the public. Um, the public did not like the special recreation zone. Uh, ultimately, the park finalized the general management plan in June of 2015. It did have the marine reserve zone in that plan uh, following the passage of the plan, there was another congressional hearing in August of that year. So a little bit of history on the fishery management plan. That's what we're going to focus on tonight. So the, this plan began development also in the year 2000, and there was an MOU that was signed between FWC and the park. And both agencies wanted to work collaboratively on this plan because of the overlapping authorities in the park and both agencies saw the benefits of working collaboratively with the ultimate goal being that the FWC would promulgate the fisheries rules for the entire park 
so that a person fishing in the park uh, would not need to know which jurisdiction that they were in. So as they were moving through the park, they would have similar fisheries regulations for the entire park. Uh, the MOU between FWC and the Park Service was renewed multiple times, and in 2013, our FWC commissioners approved the fishery management plan and confirmed the intent to proceed with ru the rulemaking process for the preferred alternative management measures in that plan. And so this is the start of that rulemaking process tonight. And uh, in 2014, the Park Service and FWC finalized that plan. So a little bit about the preferred alternative that's in the plan. Uh, well, first, uh, let me just tell you about the FMP in general. Uh, the fishery management plan's purpose is to fulfill the National Park Service mandate to balance fishing access with resource protection and maintain the resources for high usage, as well as address local depletion in the park, particularly the average size and abundance of fish species in the park. The preferred alternative in the plan was to rebuild and conserve park fisheries resources, and it seeks a substantial improvement in fishery status and a reduction in fishing-related habitat impacts, with the specific goal being to increase the size and abundance of targeted fish and invertebrate species within Biscayne National Park by at least 20%. So just a little bit about the MOU between FWC and the Park Service. So this facilitated management of Biscayne National Park fish and invertebrate resources. It recognized that the management goals inside the national park may be different than elsewhere. It confirmed that FWC and Biscayne National Park agree that properly regulated fishing will continue inside the park. It specified that no fishing zones or marine reserves should only be considered after less restrictive management measures had been tried first. And it acknowledged that FWC would play a crucial role in promulgating these new regulations. So this MOU expired in 2014, but the park and FWC have been continuing as if this is still in place. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff, who's gonna tell you a little bit about the science plan. So this science plan was, uh, was generated in response to the uh, passing of the fishery management plan. And as uh, Jessica stated, the fishery management plan stated the goal was to increase the average size and abundance of fish by 20%. So the science plan set out to use the available data to assess how this was uh, going to be measured and what data was going to be used. So the first step was to define the baselines for targeted fisheries resources. Um, specifically looking at the average size and abundance of, uh, of fish species, and then also develop benchmarks for these resources. Uh, what, um, what is the current baseline, and then what size do, they, do these fish have to reach in order to reach uh, this, this specific baseline? Now, to do all this, we decided to use, uh, after evaluating all the different data, we decided to use the uh, reef visual census data, which is a fishery independent data set where these divers will go in the water and count, um, and count size and enumerate fish. Uh, within a given area and use that, that long-term data set to then evaluate change over time within the park. Um, in addition, the science plan then establishes timelines uh, for future progress reports, how often it will report back to the commission, and, um, and it also provides exploration of, of why certain benchmarks for certain fish species, why they may not have been met, and, uh, and what type of research to explain why this uh, was, might have occurred. So I'm going to do a little overview of the Reef Visual Census, which is called the RVC. Uh, this is a long-term data set going back 20 years. Um, we, this has gone from, uh, this monitoring program has gone from the Dry Tortugas all the way up to Martin County. Um, and it's a very established, statistically robust uh, monitoring program that's been vetted by scientists. There's several publications on it. Um, and we, the FWC has been involved in this program since 2008. Uh, but there's other partners as well, the National Park Service, Biscayne National Park, University of Miami, among others, and all these scientists uh, come together to do these fish counts to create uh, a large data set of all these fish counts across the entire uh, reef tract of Florida. So when we go out and do these fish counts, a team of four divers will conduct a fish census at each site, and each diver records, like I mentioned before, the presence, abundance, and size of all fish species within their given area. Each diver is actually trained and has to go through a rigorous training program where they have to be able, be able to identify um, all the different species, be able to size them correctly um, and count them correctly. And 
once they're trained, then their data is used in this program. So it's a very rigorous program so that we know that all the data that we are collecting is, is valid and, and is accurate. And then the, the benefit of this as well is that all these different agencies go through the same program, it's training program, so that all this data from National Park Service, from Biscayne National Park, from FWC can, can, be, can be combined, so we split the effort across the entire reef track. The sites within Biscayne National Park, selected amongst the other, other sites as well, are selected by stratified random sampling, uh, stratified by habitat, so we only do these counts in a hard bottom habitat. However, we will stratify it by all the different habitats, such as low relief hard bottom, high relief reef, in order to have a representative sample of the habitat within a given area. For Biscayne National Park, we had 88 sites, which are these grids, these sampling grids. Within each sampling grid, we have then four divers to conduct counts, so there's quite a lot of data there. And within the last 10 years, we have over 1,000 uh, samples in the Biscayne National Park. Now, this RBC has been conducted, like I said, it's a long-term data set. Um, it was conducted every year up to 2012, and then since 2012, it's been conducted every other year. So based on the data that we had from the uh, reef visual census and looking at the fish that are typically harvested within Biscayne National Park and using the life history of the species, we selected these tier one species that we felt that would uh, be amenable to any sort of these regulations that we're putting forward and also have enough data to be able to measure the response of these fish species to determine whether or not they are meeting these benchmarks that we established in the science plan. Uh, for the tier one species, we have several snappers, um, group, well, red grouper, hogfish, gray triggerfish, blue striped grunt, and white grunt. There are some tier two species that currently lack adequate data um, or their life history is not amenable to these different regulations but um, they're just, right now they're a lower priority than the tier one species, but that's not to say that in the future if we have more data, they might be moved up to tier one. So to evaluate all these different benchmarks, again, we first established the baseline using the RVC data. We used RVC data from 2008 to 2018, uh, determining, calculating the density, frequency of currents, and average size of all these tier one fish species. Um, the average size would be the average size of fish that are above the legal size. For fish like the grunts, we used average size above the length of maturity. Um, and again, the benchmark we established is 20% above this baseline, which is the average sizes from that time period. Um, so we calculated that for all the fish species, so the benchmark is 20% over the current size. Uh, we set out to do progress reports every seven years. However, um, if we were directed by the commission, we can uh, come back sooner or later, depending on what, uh, what the needs are and what we are finding within Biscayne National Park. Um, and then we are setting out to determine whether or not the size and abundance uh, has been reached. And we expect, you know, it, it, every, um, we expect that these, these could be reached, but if it hasn't been reached, then we will provide recommendations about why maybe it hasn't been reached or, um, or there are some species that are slower growing than others. We expect maybe some grunt species would reach this first compared to uh, some longer lived species like red grouper. So um, we're kind of in these progress reports, we'll be explaining uh, why or why these have or have not been met. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to Jessica for, to explain the uh, different proposals within the fishery management plan. All right, thanks, Jeff. So first, this is just an overview slide of the various management actions that we're proposing from the fishery management plan. Uh, these are a suite of changes to FWC's fishing regulations that would be inside the park in order to achieve the fishery management plan goals. So it's in six categories. I'm gonna show you more detail on the coming slides, but modifying size and bag limits based on the science plan that Jeff told you about. For spear fishing, limitations on the use of scuba and trigger mechanisms, uh, trap-free coral reef protection areas, a trap-free zone north and east of park headquarters at Convoy Point, a no trawl zone, and elimination of lobster mini season. And as I mentioned before, the Park Service and FWC agreed that FWC would promulgate these fishing regulations for the entire park, not just in one section or another. So this is the size and bag limit proposal. So there were handouts. If you can't see the screen very well, there's handouts that have this in detail out there on the table. So first I'm gonna focus on these minimum size limits in the top part of the table. So this is for recreational and commercial. So the current size limit is here on the left. The proposed size limit is here on the right. 
So the proposed size limit is a 20% increase to the current minimum size that was calculated in order to shift the size structure of these species towards the park's goal. There's two exceptions here, one for mutton snapper and one for hogfish. So mutton snapper was recently changed from 16 to 18 inches, therefore only needing an additional inch to 19 inches uh, to get to the 20% increase. And then hogfish was recently changed from 12 inches to uh, 16 inches, and this is a 33% increase over the previous minimum size, so no additional increase is proposed for hogfish at this time. For species that don't have a current size limit, like the grunts, the proposed size limit is 20% larger than the size at maturity. Also for these size limits, we're uh, suggesting allowing direct and continuous transit of fish harvested uh, in areas outside the park, say with federal size limits, uh, through Biscayne National Park to boat ramps in the park or through the park into some ramps north of the park. Um, the bottom table here is for uh, recreational bag limits. So the recreational bag limits that are species specific would already apply. Then in addition to that, we're proposing two aggregate bag limits. So one would be this 20 fish aggregate possession limit per person. This would be for the major fin fish species like snapper grouper species. We have a handout out there that lists all the species that would be in this aggregate. And then also a bait fish aggregate of 100 fish per person. So these are possession limits. So unlike the size limits, these are possession limits so that if you're fishing outside the park and you're going to come back in through Biscay National Park, that you shouldn't have more than your 20 fish aggregate for the major fin fish or the 100 uh, fish possession limit of bait fish. And this is the larger bait fish. There's some bait fish that are excluded from this limit. In addition, this uh, stone crab and blue crab, these suggested limits are half of the current statewide limits for the park. So for spearfishing limitations, so the options that were identified in the fishery management plan were to prohibit trigger mechanisms and prohibit air providing equipment. The purpose of this was to uh, reduce the harvest of undersized fish. Biscayne National Park data show that spearfishers in the park are more than twice as likely as anglers to take at least one undersized fish per trip. A couple things to consider is that all spearfishing is prohibited in nearby John Penny Camp Coral Reef State Park, as well as the Upper Keys. For coral reef protection areas, uh, these small areas, so there's, there's more maps out there and there were posters out there, so we're proposing these five areas in yellow here. In these areas, it would prohibit the use of traps within those areas, but hook and line fishing, spearing, and other activities would still be allowed. So the purpose of this is to protect natural coral reef habitat from trap-related damage. So we're proposing these five areas. The total square miles of these five areas combined is 1.22 square miles. The fishery management plan also identified a trap-free zone north and east of park headquarters at Convoy Point. And uh, lobster harvest is already prohibited in this area, but this would prohibit all other traps. This was to provide a natural viewscape from park headquarters and to help avoid conflicts with non-consumptive visitors in this high-use area. So this would be people using kayaks, paddle boards, et cetera. And the, there are two options. So this option here on the left that comes to a point, this was the option that was actually identified in the fishery management plan. We're proposing another option over here that is more straight line boundaries and doesn't come to a point here. So these are two options that are being considered and we're looking for feedback on these options. Uh, the plan also identified a no trawl zone to protect important nursery habitat and reduce juvenile fish and invertebrate bycatch. So we're proposing uh, two separate options for consideration that we're looking for feedback on. So there's one option here that goes over to the intercoastal, and then there's another option here that goes over to the West Feather Bed Banks. Uh, the fishery management plan also uh, suggested eliminating lobster mini season in order to protect coral reef habitat from diver related damage. Um, there's a similar rule in nearby John Penny Camp Coral Reef State Park. And also in this green area here on this map, 
Uh, this is the Biscayne Bay Card Sounds Spiny Lobster Sanctuary, and lobster harvest is already prohibited year-round inside this green area, which is a, a fairly large portion of the park. And uh, it's also prohibited in the other two nearby national parks in Everglades and Tortugas. So just a little bit about the next steps. So this is the last of three public workshops that we're holding. I've mentioned a number of other ways that you can provide public feedback. So we'll be reviewing that feedback and then the plan is right now to take uh, all the feedback and uh, management recommendations for a draft rule to our commission in October it, on the second and third and this meeting is set for Canaveral. So that concludes our presentation and now we're gonna do our question and answer period with the panel here and I'm gonna ask uh, Tom Reinert if he can help facilitate this. All right, thank you. So uh, th again, this is a question and answer period. If your question sounds curiously like a comment, I'm gonna pick someone else to, to go to. So uh, this is to get information on what was presented here tonight, if you have any confusion. Um, and we will have a time for public comment later. We do have a survey that we wanna get to uh, that I think you'll find very interesting and will allow you to express your comments. So do we have any questions uh, for the panel regarding what was presented here tonight? Here we go, we got a couple here. And I will hold the mic, so don't try to take it from me. <laughs> On the science plan, is SWC the lead agency? And is it in place now, and if not, when? So the science plan was, uh, uh, it's a collaborative uh, plan that was developed both by Biscayne National Park and by FWC, so we both, scientists and individuals from each agency came together to develop the science plan um, and this plan is just uh, defining what is going to be done uh, to, to meet the goals of the fishery management plan. And it's just a draft at this point, so we're getting feedback on this plan, so you can give us feedback tonight or in the coming months. Our plan is to finalize that with our commission later this year. No, I did not get an answer. <laughs> I asked you if FWC was the lead agency, number one, and is the plan in place now, and if not, when? So the plan would be in place after it's finalized, which would be later this year, so it would be finalized by our commission, and there's not one agency that's lead over the other. Both Biscayne National Park and FWC are co-leads on this plan. It was a collaborative process. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, question. We have one here. I don't know that I need the microphone. I had, a, I had a, a question about your bait fish possession um, and the list of the bait fish that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. I'm just for curiosity's sake. With the, the pilchards and the scale sardines and whatnot, you're allowed 100? Yes, that's what the proposal is if you have something different. So we're going to ask you some questions about this in the live survey and also if you want to give us public comment that you either want them included or excluded, that's the type of information we'd love to hear. Okay, thank you. How many FWC officers are on duty at any given time in the Biscayne Bay area? And when was the last time that they received raises? So I'm not that sure. That is a great question. I'm gonna, I don't know if, uh, okay. and, I, and I love the intent of it too, so. I'm going to go to Captain Mazza over here. So, so I'm the area captain from Miami-Dade County, which covers Biscayne National Park. So I'm, I'm responsible for 25 uniform patrol officers. So I got 25 guys for the county. I got four lieutenants that patrol, that supervise those 25 guys. So 29 rough, roughly that are patrolling the county. In the National Park, we, we currently have three vessels in different boats, either uh, Black Point or Homestead that are patrol boats of ours that are used in the park that patrol that area. So to answer your question, on a, on a given day, a given weekend, we could have two or three boats patrolling out there uh, in the National Park area, alongside with National Park officers who are also stationed at Biscayne National Park. And Captain, the reference... Can you elaborate on the additional resources that we got to the legislature while it was not fully funded at our request? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's... Yeah, I mean, well, there's, there's positions being 
we're, we're going to get more positions eventually in, in the county. We've actually, if you've been familiar with Day County, from when I started 22 years ago to now, the officers have increased a lot. We have a lot more officers. So there's been some funding through legislator to get more positions. That's constantly being worked on. So it's an issue that we know as law enforcement that we need we need more patrol officers out there. I struggle with this daily as a captain in the area, but we're just constantly being looked at and, and more officers are being put in the area. I do appreciate the question. Uh, uh, FWC did ask for more officers uh, this past legislative session. Uh, we were fortunate to get some of our requests fulfilled, but clearly uh, not to the level that uh, we sought and in all probability we'll continue to pursue that understand the need. Uh, and you also asked last time there was a raise. Um, we have been successful over the last few years to get a few pay additives for our officers, um, but it's it's been a couple of years, I think. And biologists haven't had a raise in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there any way to fund what we're looking at right now, more officers, uh, more research through specific charging for uh, licenses or permits that are used in the area that we need to protect or we're trying to protect? That's a, that's a very good question. I think it was brought up, and I don't know, Jessica, if you want to address it, but it was brought up last night about maybe a, per, a special spearfishing license for the park, and uh, there may be ways to do that. It's hard for the state to enact new fees and new licenses, but uh, Jessica. Yeah, so I was just talking to Vanessa about that. So if there was some type of special license for the park itself, then that money could go right back into Biscayne, a fund uh, that Biscayne could spend, and they could use it for more law enforcement officers or more research, what have you. So the, the easiest way, and it's still not simple, but the easiest way might be uh, to go through some type of special license for the park itself, through the park. It's, a, it's an act of the legislature for the state to create a new license fee. So I had a, here. On the uh, presentation, you mentioned that there, that a spear fisherman is uh, scuba, is likely more likely to take a fish undersized than a fisherman. Are you talking about commercial boats taking spear fishing, or are you talking about recreational? That's Vanessa. That's her data. So that data is taken from recreational folks returning back to Homestead Bayfront Marina, and it does not differentiate whether or not they were on scuba, just to be clear. It's simply spearfishing versus hook and line, that data comparison. And not necessarily triggered either, so it's any fish with a hole in it. So it could be triggered, could be pole or Hawaiian sling. We had a question down here. Well, as a follow-up to the prior question, when citations are written and fines are enforced does within the park boundaries, does that money stay within the park for additional enforcement and additional manpower, or does it go to Washington and why? It does not stay within the park. It goes to a general fund. Okay. We had another question. Um, yeah, I want to make sure I understood about um, the science. If you're monitoring yearly, but you're only reporting every seven years, that doesn't make any sense to me. Could you please explain that? Yeah, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear enough. The, uh, the current monitoring is set to monitor every other year, um, but right now the progress reports, which is the reports that we generate from this data that we then uh, give back to the commission, is generated every seven years. So we take that monitoring data within that seven years and combine it to just come up with an overall report every seven years right now. And that's a, like a full report in seven years, and Commissioner Soule has asked that uh, we do periodic updates in between to make sure that we keep our commissioners well informed of the progress. <laughs> so, uh, one, I do want to see progress uh, interim, but I also acknowledge in order to see results, it does take time. This is, this is a process that we're not going to see magically measurable, quantifiable, or statistically quantifiable results year one, year two, or potentially even year three. It's going to take time before you really get to see the efficacy of the results that are of the efforts that we put forward. But you should see trends, and you should be able to see trends early on. So I've at least commented early on that I'd like to see interim reports uh, just to see an understanding of where is it, where is it heading. 
Hold on one second. We need the microphone for the recording. You've, there have been science studies here for decades. And so I'm just saying that progress reports every seven years, is it's too far away. You, you can't keep track of the resource every seven years, not with the population we have now. Okay, well, so, it's not like we're going to so just because look we're, at Just it. because we're generating a full report every seven years, we are still analyzing this data every time it's collected. And every time we get it, we're going to be summarizing it. And we have that data and keeping track of it. We're just not generating the full report until that seven years. Can we have one right here? Yeah, so this is also a science question. Uh, you mentioned during your presentation of the science plan that you believe that the FMP goals for these fisheries can be reached. But based on research provided to you in advance of this meeting from Dr. Jerry Alt, who FWC recognized as a world-renowned authority on this topic, we know that the recommended size limits for a number of species, I have a question coming, for a number of species will be nowhere near what is needed for a minimum viable population. So based on what science or what opinion uh, do you believe uh, what you stated, that, that the 20% increase or the overall goal can be reached? So, um, yeah, Dr. Ault helped develop this, uh, the RVC program, so he really made a really great statistically robust uh, program, so we're definitely taking a lot of input from him. However, um, his assessment of the fish is uh, more on the stock level, and this is Biscayne National Park is a much smaller area than, than what a stock is. A stock can go all the way from, you know, all the way up from the Atlantic coast, from North Carolina all the way down to, to Florida um, for a stock. We're trying to, we're not trying to manage stock, we're trying to manage Biscayne National Park. So all these regulations were made at the scale of Biscayne National Park. Um, and follow-up to um, a couple of questions before me. So you say that their progress reports will take place every seven years or interim progress reports a little bit, um, you know, more, um, more commonly. So that's wonderful. Um, so when those reports show that there's no increase or if there is a decrease, will action be part of the response or is there only going to be more science? So once we get those progress reports back, then if there is an increase or a decrease, then we would try to determine the reasons for that. So we would look at all kinds of different factors, uh, whether it's fishing or whether it's environmental or what have you. Uh, we would go back to the commission with uh, what that assessment is, meaning our assessment of why it's increased or decreased, and we would at that time make a recommendation about whether we stay the course or whether we do additional regulations or make changes. So if you, if you find that the fisheries are decreasing and you choose to stay the course, um, you know, how long does then that study the, the follow-up study to figure out why the decrease is happening, another three years, two years? Um, it just seems like the, there's not an action, a regulatory action to help protect. So and, there's not a build toward, you know, rebuilding and conserving fisheries. In the yeah, so there's not an automatic action, if that's what you're asking. So the commission would make a decision, and then, as you've heard our commissioner state, um, they like to see progress reports uh, more frequently than every seven years. So I think that if they saw a decrease, they'd probably like to see a progress report a lot sooner than seven years and try to take some management actions if it was in their realm in the fisheries wheelhouse to try to make a difference as soon as they can. I think it's safe to say that, you know, our, our monitoring program, we're going to keep our thumb on the pulse and keep track of that. So, uh, Bill? Uh, Jessica, the, the Biscayne National Park for years, dating all the way back to that House Natural Resources Committee hearing in 2015, has is, is portrayed Biscayne National Park as a watery wasteland, when nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, we're seeing historic uh, uh, levels of turtle nesting, crocodile populations, the stock assessments on many of these key indicator species, uh, yellowtail snapper, for example, uh, you know, and, and mangrove snappers. They're, they're in excellent condition. And when you assess, when you do a stock assessment, as you know, chairing that committee uh, for the South Atlantic Council, you assess them throughout their range. Bordering eighth largest metropolis, there might be some size variations and so forth. But uh, our 
position is, you know, water quality, uh, law enforcement, uh, those are key issues uh, that are not being addressed as appropriately by the park. You know, we just had a, a sewer main break there last week by a contractor. Just prior to that, a few months, 28 million gallons of raw sewage discharged by Miami-Dade's aging infrastructure. In fact, in the last five to 10 years, there's been a major oil, or no oil, uh, solid waste spill in the neighborhood of 100 million gallons. Right. In, so the question is, you know, we probably wouldn't be here if, if they addressed those issues. Is the park doing any action or taking action to address those kinds of things? And uh, when, and the other question is, from your experience, um, underwater fish counts and stuff, how do they compare when you stack them up against the stock assessment? I don't think uh, they have any validity over the long haul of the stock. That's a matter of scale. I think uh, Jeff will get to that. But Vanessa, maybe you want to take the uh, habitat water quality question. So you asked if the park is doing anything. And yes, we are on the things that we can control. Some of the um, specific items you mentioned, such as sewage main breaks, that's out of our control. We're not a regulatory agency. Um, not It's not on our grounds. So we cannot do things like that. But other areas where we can such as with the um, comprehensive Everglades restoration project. We are actively working in restoring the bay to become more of its um, previous estuarine habitat. And so we are actually seeing advances in that. Just this week we had reports of um, increased um, sawgrass along the, the bay. So we do get involved, we do do what we can. And on other issues where we do not, we're not the regulating agency or it's not under our purview, we do provide public comments, attend meetings, and give our point of view and our, our priorities. And I just want to elaborate too about the, uh, the stock assessment. Again, this is at the Biscayne scale as well. And um, I was on the, uh, um, one of the indices group for the recent yellowtail assessment, yellowtail snapper assessment, which we looked at both commercial, recreational, and RVC data and compared the trends to one another. And actually the trends match up really, really tightly between commercial data, recreational data, and these fish count data. Obviously they're different scales, but the trends are matched, same dips, same increases, they match really, really well. All right, thank you, we got a question back here. Yeah, I served on the working group back in 2002, 2004. Do you guys still have the recommendations that were made by our working group from back in that time? And I have one more question after that. I could go back and look it up. So um, I think that we have them. Yes, I don't have it with me tonight. Okay. The next question I, I didn't see on there, is there going to, are you guys going to work on a phase out of commercial fishing in the park? Because I didn't see it up there. So the reason that you didn't see it, so you're right, that was in the fishery management plan. If a phase out of commercial fishing happens, that would be a park action, not an FWC action. And so what we're talking about tonight are the FWC uh, actions. And uh, Tom, he has a follow-up, Ernie has a follow-up. So Jessica, in that, on the brown areas that you were showing on that screen at first, when, you know, when you're doing the first presentation, yeah, that's the area that you guys control and, and they, the park, they can do it in the monument part, right? Is that how that's gonna work? Yeah, so Vanessa and I were discussing that. I believe because it's uh, relative to a fishing license, I believe the fishery management plan defines a special park-specific commercial fishing license, and that particular license would be phased out over time and use it or lose it, and it would be a park action. I believe that the park has the final authority over licensing uh, throughout their waters. Okay, we got a question over here. Yeah, I have a question about the mini season elimination. What's the science behind it? We uh, heard about the science and the fish counts and all. <clears throat> yeah, so I didn't uh, elaborate on that, but the science behind it is based on a, a few studies. Uh, I guess probably the most pertinent study would be one that was conducted uh, in the Florida Keys uh, in three different areas, the Western Sambos, Eastern Sambos, and Middle Sambos, which, as you might know, uh, the Western Sambos is, uh, is a no-take reserve. The other one, there's also a, a, a research-only area, which doesn't allow divers at all. And then there is the, uh, and then the other one allows take. So what this uh, research did was they looked at damage to coral in each of the different areas and got a baseline before mini season, and then went and surveyed these reefs after mini season. 
and what they found that there was no damage increase inside the no take area which does it was just a lot recreational divers but not harvesters there was no increase within the research only area which doesn't allow any anybody to go in those areas but the the open areas did have an increase in damage to the to the coral reefs we got one over here yeah I just wanted to ask about the no trawling zone in the general management plan is there plans for additional closing areas and also for the lobster so I'm not sure I understand the question so the the what you saw tonight are all items that are in the fisheries management plan are you asking if there's additional items that are going to be regulatory in nature coming out of the general management plan is that the question well I was at the meeting last night in Homestead and you guys said that you were planning on additional closing of areas so what you're seeing on there is not the whole picture at least from what I took from what I heard last night so in the general management plan there was a marine reserve zone a 10,000 acre marine reserve zone and that area was in the monument portion of the park so the park has not gone through the regulations to put that in place yet but they could so that would be an additional area coming through the general management plan which is not what we're discussing here right we're only talking about regulations through the fisheries management plan and so what we've proposed what you see here is what the proposal is so there wouldn't be something in addition at this time unless it came through the park right okay we got one over here with this plan is there any consideration on the implications of like the outside areas say the upper Florida Keys other parts of northern Miami on the stress that might result from these regulation changes and how will that be studied and researched so yeah I'm not quite sure about the any sort of displacement or how that would stress out surrounding areas however there is monitoring that it goes on this the RBC program as I mentioned before is not exclusive to Biscayne National Park it is a reef wide assessment program that is conducted on just outside the proximity of Biscayne National Park so you know potentially it could also pick up any sort of impacts that way so there is active monitoring going on in these different areas outside the park as a follow-up I do believe a part of the seven-year management plan like the survey that you guys put together I do think it'd be beneficial to put in the outside areas so if you guys see a 20% increase as you hope over the seven years and if you see a strong decrease in other areas especially spiny lobster the removal of mini lobster season I think that that should be included in for the public to know yeah that's and that's a good comment and I'm sure in the in the report you know like I said we're gonna do an in-depth report that those outside areas would also be considered with comparing into the inside how we doing over got one over here one there maybe we can start passing out the clickers looks like we're kind of slowing down so we got a couple more questions and we'll get the clickers passed out to you you can correct me if I'm wrong but on most wildlife regulations aren't harvest records one of the best tools that you have to manage and and develop management regulations and rules and if that is the case can we not have harvest records which seem to be the best tool that you have because you I know you're doing these studies but everybody knows that that's very inaccurate for what's actually there it's I guess it's a baseline of what they happen to see that time the fish might not be there but but I know that harvest records I believe are one of the one of the most used tools to develop management regulations on management areas where where states have the ability to you know develop harvest regulations dough harvesting you know different things like that that that's been the best tool if I'm not mistaken and why would that not be the best tool and direct resources to monitor the harvest at the at the boat ramps to to really get a better indication of what's happening with the resource and then you could see that 20% increase decrease whatever and manipulate them the the regulations based on a more accurate data of what's actually out there so the reason we selected some of these specific species is that these are species that we frequently see during these reef visual census dives so these are species that we expect to be able to to monitor 
their change. Now, you said it is also uh, important to, to look at uh, a harvest data, recreational data. Um, I did assess, or the science team also assessed uh, creel surveys, which are conducted by the park, and also MRIP data in the area. And what we found was that while well, the MRIP is a too big of a scale to look at inside, specifically inside the park. Oh, sorry, the MRIP is the... Um, Marine Recreational Information Sorry. Program, formerly known as MRFs, Marine Recreational Fisheries Statistics Survey. So MRIP has two components. So there's a component where you have people at the dock looking at the catch like you're describing. And it also, it used to be a telephone survey where they uh, dialed coastal households. Now MRIP has switched over to paper. We get a lot better response with paper, especially since people have uh, switched to uh, not having landlines. And then if they see a call coming in that they don't recognize, they don't answer it. So MRIP is a, a two-part survey and MRIP is, is really throughout the nation. but. And so what Jeff is saying is that while MRIP data is okay, it's just not at a fine enough scale, but they do have inside the park uh, fishery specific uh, creel, um, looking at the harvest creel data coming from the park themselves. And that was part of the information that Jeff is referring to. Yeah, so, and what I mentioned before was that, uh, at least in one of the most more recent CDAR assessments, uh, which just uh, looks at data for assessing different stocks, uh, I was on Yellowtail Snapper, and we looked, we compared the trends with the reef visual census data compared to the trends that we see in the different recreational commercial data, and the trends match up. So we felt confident that this was uh, catching these different changes in the species over time. Yeah, and I just, I don't want you to think that the creel data inside the park is going to be ignored. For us, it's just another tool of what we're going to look at when we're looking at these progress reports. And the issue was that the creel data, um, you know, whether it was good for some species, um, we weren't confident for all the species that had enough data to really uh, establish a really uh, good baseline for them. So if we had enough, we would, we would definitely use that. How we, still, we will still use it for those species that we have enough data for. It's, it's, we have fishery dependent and fishery independent yes. data sources. So we have data that we collect in an independent fashion, and then we have data we rely on the fishermen. And those, those are all tools in the toolbox that we help that combine to give us the information that we need. So. We got a question right here. Um, in regards to the coral reef protection areas, you said that there's only 1.22 cumulative square miles um, for only no trapping zones. Is there science that says that traps are like the reason for fish population decline, like mainly traps, or is there fishing as well? Or um, if I understand your question correctly, the um, the reason we are proposing those traps is not a direct benefit to fish, but an indirect through the habitat. Our research shows that the traps are highly um, negative on the reef. They damage and kill lots of marine organisms, so that is the purpose of having those, is to promote healthy reefs, which would then support the fish. All right, we got another question over here. With your harvest data and your creel limit data, um, one thing that you failed to include in that and that is all the fish that are caught that are released. And probably one out of every 10 fish caught, probably something like that, are actually take, taken as, as food fish. At least nine fish. A number of those fish die from handling, uh, poor fishing, uh, the heat of the water. They've kept on the line too long, sharks get them. There's no recognition for that and that is unfortunately the fallacy in the plan. Is that your question? So, so do we have a discard data? Well, and then so we got some, one more question over Some here. of the release information, as Jeff mentioned, is in the stock-wide assessment. So for example, in the yellowtail stock assessment, uh, there's release mortality information at the stock level. But what I heard, Mr. Causey, is that it sounds like you want a logbook program inside Biscay <laughs> National Park a logbook program where you want fishermen and captains uh, to record what they're catching and the sizes and number of fish release. <laughs> okay. We got a question. If, if, oh. 
Can I just quickly add that we at the park do also collect information. We ask them how many did they release, and so we have that, but these analyses were done on what we saw because we know that that is the facts right there. It requires there. honesty from the yeah. fishermen. Um, I have a genuine question in terms of when you have the lobster traps and lobster, uh, sorry, Sam, um, the licenses for the lobster uh, fishing and, and whatnot. There seemed to, you know, we're having trouble getting all the lobster rope and the lobster traps out. Is there a way you can, you know, before you get out more lobster traps and more lobster rope, is there a way we can get the public to bring them back in before they take, put more in? Just a question. Is there a way to manage that versus you, we're going out on dives and pulling up all the rope, pulling up all the traps? Is there, have you guys thought about it? I have no idea. I'm just asking. At Biscayne, we recently received a grant, and we are supporting now five um, full-time divers who are going out every day and cleaning the reef. And they've um, been diving in the park since May, and on my last crunch the numbers, they've already pulled up 27,000 pounds of garbage, most of which is um, trap and hook and line debris. Um, we also have volunteer efforts where we um, encourage people to come out and... rope to for those people can't they bring their lobster traps back in their lobster rope before we put it back in and then have the volunteers go pull it out that's what i'm saying yes so they're required at the end of the season to bring their traps in there are occasions during storm events or let's say the rope gets cut off that some of these things end up moving around and maybe they can't recover all of their gear so in addition to what vanessa is explaining fwc has a derelict trap removal program and we go out and we comb the state annually during the closed months and we pull out traps, we pull out rope, we pull out buoys. Um, and so we're working with fishermen to actually remove that gear. So they are required to do it. And then during those closed months, we go out there and try to remove it as well. Okay, I think uh, we've kind of wind down a little bit on the questions, so we're going to move to our survey portion. I'm going to turn it back over to Jessica for that. All right, thank you. So now we're going to move into the live survey, and I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Foss, and she's going to walk you through using these clickers to do the live survey. All right, does everyone have an eye clicker, one of these little white clickers? If you don't, raise your hand, and we'll make sure one of our staff gets you one. Just bear with me as I put everything together. Sorry, go a little ahead. All right, so my name is Kristen and I'm going to be administering the live survey session portion of this workshop. So the person, purpose of this session is to gather your thoughts and opinions on fisheries regulations within Biscayne National Park. So I'm gonna pose a series of 24 questions and these questions are designed to allow FWC staff as well as National Park to develop a better understanding of what workshop attendees think about and want for fisheries management within the park. All right, so let's get started. If everyone can locate the power button on your clicker and just turn that on, you should see a green light. So at any point, if you see a flashing red light or your power button does not stay on, uh, raise your hand and one of our staff members will replace it um, or give you some new batteries. All right, so I'm gonna ask these questions one at a time and a question will appear on the screen along with four to five possible responses. I'm gonna read each question aloud as well as the possible responses. And after each question, there's going to be a polling period and that's when you're able to submit your answer. So if you look at your clicker, you can see that there are five buttons labeled A through E. And these buttons are what you're gonna to use to submit your responses. And if you do not wanna answer or if none of these possible answers apply to you, you do not have to select um, an answer for the question. And at any time while the polling period is active, you can change your answer. So if you accidentally select A, but you really meant D, you can just go ahead and change that. And if any of you guys cannot read the screen, it's quite large. 
uh, or you would like a copy of these iClicker questions, just raise your hand and we have copies of these. We also have them in Spanish if you would like to have a copy of that. So we're going to do a test question just to make sure uh, we all know how to do this. All right, let's start out. What is your favorite color? A, blue, B, red, C, yellow, D, green, or E, none of the above. So I've started the polling period, and I'm going to keep it open until everyone has submitted their answer. All right, has so everyone submitted their response? I'm going to close the poll. And at the end, I will show the results of each question. So it looks like we like blue and green in here. Just trying to get this open. All right, so let's start the questions. All right, number one, choose the option that best describes you. A, a private recreational fisher, angler or spearfisher, B, a for hire fishing charter or head boat captain, C, a commercial fisherman, D, a diver or recreational boater as a non-harvester, or E, a concerned citizen. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. And here are the results. Number two, which county are you currently a resident? A, Broward, B, Miami-Dade, C, Monroe, D, Florida County not listed above, or E, a non-Florida resident? I'm going to close the poll, and there are the results. Number three, which of the following best describes your primary recreational fishing activity within Biscayne National Park? A, angling, includes headboats, fishing charters, and cast netting. B, spearing. C, lobstering. D, crabbing, or E, I do not participate in recreational fishing activities within the park. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. And there are the results. Number four, which of the following best describes your primary commercial fishing activity within Biscayne National Park? I do not submit an answer if you do not commercially fish. A, angling includes cast netting. B, spearing. C, trapping. D, shrimping. Or E, ballyhoo fishing. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Number five, which of the following best describes your primary non-fishing marine activity within Biscayne National Park? A, recreational boating, which includes tubing, skiing, jet ski. B, diving or snorkeling. C, kayak, canoe, or paddleboard. D, near shore activities such as swimming and kiteboarding. Or E, I do not participate in non-fishing marine activities within the park. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll.
Number six, when using a boat inside Biscayne National Park, from where do you most often depart? A, public boat ramp marina inside the park, such as Black Point or Bayfront Park. B, a public boat ramp marina outside the park, such as Matheson or Rickenbacker. C, a private boat ramp marina dock inside the park. D, a private boat ramp marina dock outside the park. Or E, I do not use a boat within Biscayne National Park. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and here are the results. Number seven, when departing on a boat from a location within the park, where do you conduct your marine activities? A, mostly inside Biscayne National Park boundaries. B, mostly outside the park boundaries. C, equally inside and outside the park boundaries. D, I use a boat but do not depart from a location inside the park. Or E, I do not use a boat for my marine activities. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and here are the results. Number eight, how long have you been conducting your marine activities within the park? A, less than a year, B, one to five years, C, five to ten years, D, more than ten years, or E? I have never been to Biscayne National Park. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And here are the results. Number nine, which of the following best describes your opinion of the targeted fish populations within Biscayne National Park? A, targeted fish populations are abundant. B, some targeted fish species are abundant, others are not abundant. C, targeted fish populations are not abundant. Or D, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Number 10, which of the following best describes your experience within Biscayne National Park? A, I am satisfied with the size and amount of fish that I encounter. B, I am satisfied with the size of fish that I encounter, but not the amount of fish. C, I am satisfied with the amount of fish that I encounter, but not the size of fish. D, I am dissatisfied with the amount and size of fish that I encounter. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Okay, and the next series of questions are going to have the same five possible responses, so you're going to see them repeated in the next um, number of slides. So number 11, 
increasing the recreational and commercial minimum size limit of certain snapper species within Biscayne National Park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable and too restrictive. D, unacceptable and too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And here are the results. Number 12, increasing the recreational and commercial minimum size limit of red grouper within the park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable as in too restrictive. D, unacceptable as in too lenient, or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And here are the results. Number 13, increasing the recreational and commercial minimum size limit of gray triggerfish within Biscayne National Park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable isn't too restrictive. D, unacceptable isn't too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And here are the results. Number 14, establishing a recreational and commercial minimum size limit for grunt species within the park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable isn't too restrictive. D, unacceptable isn't too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And there are the results. Number 15, allowing spearfishing within Biscayne National Park, but prohibiting spearfishing with air providing equipment such as scuba and hookah. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable isn't too restrictive. D, unacceptable isn't too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And here are the results. Number 16, allowing spearfishing within Biscayne National Park, but prohibiting spearfishing with trigger mechanisms. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable as in too restrictive. D, unacceptable as in too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. 
And here are the results. Number 17, establishing a recreational bag and possession limit of 100 fish per person for bait fish within the park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable isn't too restrictive. D, unacceptable isn't too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Number 18, establishing a recreational bag and possession limit of 20 fish aggregate per person for major fin fish within Biscayne National Park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable isn't too restrictive. D, unacceptable as in too lenient, or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Number 19, reducing the recreational stone crab limit to a half gallon of cloths per person and one gallon per vessel. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable as in too restrictive. D, unacceptable as in too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Number 19, I mean, excuse me, 20, reducing the recreational blue crab limit to five gallons per person. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable isn't too restrictive. D, unacceptable isn't too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. We just have a few more. We're almost done. Number 21, prohibiting the harvest of lobster during mini season within Biscayne National Park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable as in too restrictive. D, unacceptable as in too lenient, or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Number 22, establishing trap exclusion zones around specific coral habitat within Biscayne National Park. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable as in too restrictive. D, unacceptable as in too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. Number 23, 
Number 23, establishing a traffic exclusion zone north and east of Biscayne National Park headquarters or convoy point. A, acceptable. B, no opinion, neutral. C, unacceptable as in too restrictive. D, unacceptable as in too lenient. Or E, I do not know. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, and here are the results. And our last question, establishing a no-trawl zone for commercial shrimpers within Biscayne National Park. A, acceptable, B, no opinion or neutral, C, unacceptable as in too restrictive, D, unacceptable as in too lenient, or E, I do not know. All right, I'm gonna close the poll and here are these results. All right, everyone, thank you so much for participating in the live survey.